Let's welcome back to Midpoint, author of the new book, At War, The Rise of the Military Internet Complex, Shane Harris joins us. Shane, I wanted to get to the book here before we get back to a couple of points about the NSA itself and what we were talking about here, but this basically points out that the NSA in the United States actually had a strategy that was working after all that time in Iraq, correct? That's right. In 2007, as part of this troop surge, um, the NSA developed a, a technical infrastructure, if you like, where they were able to uh, collect every phone call, every email, and every text message that was being sent in Iraq. And the reason they did this is they wanted to penetrate the communications networks that were being used by jihadists and by uh, insurgent fighters there, particularly al-Qaeda in Iraq, the group that later became ISIS, which we're fighting now. And they were able to hack into those networks. They were able to spy on what the, the fighters were saying, send them fake messages and leads and misdirection. They were even able to break into some of the web servers that jihadists were using in these various forums where they exchange information and implant spyware that was loaded onto the computers of these fighters. All of this was in service of being able to physically locate where these people were and understand what their command and control and communication structure was. And by locking into that network and giving that information to ground forces and combat forces in Iraq, they were able to ro roll up thousands of insurgents and foreign fighters. Uh, and it's really an uncredited um, strategy that many people told me was really the key to uh, winning the surge and, 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 maintain, and achieving that, uh, uh, albeit temporary, victory uh, in Iraq. Shane, if we look at what we did there, what the NSA did with Iraq there, and then let's bring it back home here for a second. What about those who would say, by basically broadcasting what we're doing here in America, by getting down on the NSA, by holding them down, that we are going to make it easier for the terrorists and the people just to come here, use this as their base, and to take care of their communications from here because they won't be looked after so hard because the American people and the government won't allow it. Well, I think that's just something that the NSA worries about, is that if we, you know, that they, they, they have a, a lot of leeway to monitor communications overseas, but they worry about what happens if terrorists were to come into the United States and how would they track them. This is, in fact, one of the reasons why, after, nine, after the 9-11 attacks, the NSA started co collecting all of the records of telephone calls placed in the United States so that they would not lose that sort of connection, if you like, that if they were monitoring someone overseas and that person came into the U.S., that they would still be able to monitor them here. So I do think that the NSA has systems in place that, by their own officials' acknowledgments publicly, give them confidence that they would be able to monitor uh, terrorists that came into the U.S., particularly if they were already tracking them overseas. I think they have a pretty good sense that they would able to keep, be able to keep tabs on them when they came here. When people talk about the other purposes that the NSA would use a lot of this metadata for, what would be the nefarious purpose that they would want to use it for? Give us an example. Well, so for instance, I mean, if, if we were living in a different time where the government wanted to go in and find out your, uh, you know, as they did a generation ago, your political affiliations, which groups you belong to, uh, who you're speaking with, if you're an activist, um, you could go through metadata and find a lot about people's associations. You could find out by looking uh, what doctor's offices you're calling, uh, what ailments you might be suffering from. Uh, if someone was uh, calling an abortion clinic, they, people have argued that you'd be able to find out if somebody was uh, uh, pregnant and contemplating uh, aborting the pregnancy. All these kind of really intimate details that you might be able to piece together from someone just by looking at who they call. And it sort of seems counterintuitive because, well, you're not listening to the phone call, you're not hearing what they're saying, but your associations and your patterns of movement um, actually reveal a lot about uh, who you are and what you're doing. And that's the concern, is that this data, if it were ever exploited for political purposes, that there is such a now a rich repository of information on all of us um, that, that, that could be exploited and misused in that way. The data is there. It's just that we have laws per, you know, restricting how it can be used. Let's remember this, too. A lot of times Americans put that out there because have you seen people's Facebook posts? I mean, <laughs> of course. I mean, this is, yeah, exactly. We're, we're willingly surrendering a lot of information about ourselves, too, and that's a very important point. Every single day. But I'll tell you, the Internet is the point where it starts, and certainly the NSA is right there. Once again, remind everybody, the book is called At War, The Rise of the Military Internet Complex. It's a fascinating read on exactly how the NSA goes about their business every day. Shane Harris, thanks so much for joining us. I look forward to the next time we speak. Thanks. I appreciate you having me on your show. Pleasure. Take care. After the break, telling it like it is goes hard edge on those seeking to remake America in their image only right here on Midpoint.